Joining me now is Congressman Mike Bost, the new chairman of the House Veterans Affairs Committee. As a veteran himself, who better to talk about the men and women who served our country? Welcome, Congressman. Thank you for having me on. Well, you have the gavel. Can you let's start off? What's your what's your agenda for this Congress, for the committee? Well, remember, there's several issues out there that we're going to be working on, uh, expanding some new legislation moving forward. We actually have, have moved a few pieces already. But a, what a lot of people don't realize, it's not just moving legislation, but it's dealing with legislation you've already passed. For instance, uh, last year, if you'll remember, we passed the PACT Act. Uh, that is the, the taking care of the needs of those post 9-11 uh, veterans who have had toxic exposure issues. We've got to make sure we give oversight to the VA to make sure that they're doing exactly what the legislation said needed to be done. Uh, when, when you're dealing with that, the other things that we're, we're focusing on uh, is our women veterans. Matter of fact, we just turned up the Women's Veterans Task Force today. Um, you know, the fastest growing group of veterans we have are our women's veterans. And unfortunately, um, many of our veterans facilities years ago, and, and they started correcting about eight or 10 years ago, but we're starting to make sure, no, we are making sure that um, women feel comfortable going to receive their services from the VA. Uh, so we'll be pushing forward with that. Uh, There's several smaller pieces of legislation that are out there uh, dealing with everything from um, things that uh, uh, the VA Cost Saving Enhancement Act was one of them. Uh, so that, that has to do with the fact that medical waste disposal, um, most major medical places actually dispose of their medical waste on site. It's safer, it's more, it's cheaper. Uh, we're trying to make sure that that's done throughout the VA and in, 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 in all of our larger facilities. So there's smaller things like that we'll be moving, but most of it's oversight, making sure, and, and for the veterans that know it and deal with it in the five places they've tried to turn it up is the uh, uh, health records, uh, the, the electronic health records. It's been a debacle from the very beginning. Uh, we're working to try to get that problem straightened out and not roll it out to other places until we do. So there's a lot of things on, on, you know, on the burner out there. That's a busy, busy agenda, no doubt. What are the biggest impediments for veterans who are disabled uh, to find jobs when they come back from combat? Well, one thing is, is the misinterpretation that our veterans are, when they come back from combat, are broken. They're not. They're the best employees you can possibly have. They're the best employees because they know the importance of showing up on time, seeing what their mission is, moving forward, and fixing uh, and working on the mission that's in front of them and doing it efficiently. Well, what we've done, though, is we're working on different programs. You know, I'm also on the Ag Committee, and, and uh, there's a bill that we've worked out there that we found out that one something that's very good for uh, veterans, that, and, and we need help in the ag industry because a lot of our younger generation are not staying with the family farm. And those places where it can work, there's a mentorship for veterans that, that go into the ag field. And what we find is if they suffer from post-traumatic stress, that is a natural help to work in the ag industry. You've got that, and then you've got vet tech, which is actually the speaker's bill originally, and it is a technical training that is, has a 75% 70, success rating of placing our veterans in technical careers. What a fantastic thing we are doing there. So we've got to continue to look and help our veterans. Of course, the important thing is they need to know that this is available. So what we're doing with that is we're working with the Department of Defense on the TAP program. Now the TAP program, the bad thing is that sometimes you have one location that might have a very good TAP program and others, they don't get all the information they need. So we're working to try to work with DOD so that a, if not a six months, a year prior to the separation from the military, these veterans and their spouses are trained on what's available to them through the VA and what services are available to them. Uh, and it is a lot, but, and, and it, it, it's very difficult sometimes to get the DOD to do that because you got to remember, whenever I left the uh, left the Marine Corps, I tell people that I got a tap, a tap on the back from my commanding officer saying, see you later, thanks. Um, this is a true program for separation that allows them to understand what all benefits are there for them. 
When you talk to uh, veterans and disabled veterans and disabled, you know, there's the physical, there's also mental. We're coming out of COVID-19, which has been tough on everybody, especially veterans who, who, who have been obviously grappling. Uh, the the uh, rate of suicide is, is unacceptable. What are you hearing from them in frustration? You mentioned some of it is that they, they don't know where to go. It's, is it education? Is it just Washington bureaucracy? It is. We, we are going to, you know, that's that's the idea behind the TAP program. And understand uh, the numbers right now, and, and you don't get those numbers until two years after the fact. So we're running on 20, uh, uh, 2020 numbers right now. Um, and that those numbers were lower. They're, they went from like 20 down to 17. But of those, only um, there there are six of those when you check on them. And they didn't ever even go to the VA or receive services from the VA at all. Now, a lot of that has to do with education when they get out. That's what we talked about with the TAP Act. A lot of that has to do with, um, uh, I believe, that maybe your first experience with the VA, which could have been um, the GI Bill, it wasn't a good one. And so you think, I'm just, I'm just not going to see that. But then there's another issue out there that I'm working on. And a lot of people don't know this, and I didn't know it until I got to Congress nine years ago. Back years ago, after... Uh, um, then President Reagan was shot. If you remember, Brady uh, went through a process of making up all these, what was known as the Brady Bills. And one of those was interpreted by the VA that if you seek help from the VA and you are having trouble with your finances and you actually are assigned a fiduciary, your name is automatically turned into the next list and you lose your Second Amendment rights. Nobody has to say you're a danger to yourself or you're a danger to others, and you do it without due process. And it's amazing to me that that occurs with veterans who fought for those rights, and they're the only ones that wouldn't get due process if they seek the help from the VA. What the problem is, is that veterans talk to each other at the VA, at, at, at our VFWs, at the Legion, at the barbershop, at the coffee shop. They talk to each other. And many of our veterans then don't seek the help that they're available to them. So I am going to, uh, I'm carrying a bill that actually is to stop that practice that actually gives our veterans due process. They can still have a fiduciary. They're not automatically assigned to be taken to the next, the next list. And the only way they are is exactly like any other citizen. Someone has to decide to challenge them on the fact that they're a danger to themselves or a danger to others, family member, it could be a, a professional, then that is taken to a court of law, and then that court can decide on whether or not that person needs to be uh, have their, their Second Amendment rights to. And is that legislation bipartisan, and, and what's the timeline for it? As of, as of right now, it is only Republican sponsors. I gladly put any Democrat on it that would want to be on it. Um, I know that if you are a person that, uh, you know, quite often we have a, a difference, not necessarily in Republican and Democrat, but the, those areas that understand gun law and those areas that don't. Um, and if you're from flyover country, that's where you see the people not seeking help from the VA because they know about that. And what's your relationship with uh, the leadership of, of VA, Dennis McDonough? Uh, that's obviously, you know, these issues... Uh, should be bipartisan, um, but obviously politics creeps into almost everything. Right. I know you've passed a handful of bipartisan bills already sent to the Senate, right. which is which is pretty good. But but what is the relationship with you and the administration on veteran affairs issues? It's it's actually very good. Um, let me tell you that the secretary and I, you've got to realize that I actually was in the state legislature with his former boss. <laughs> Remember, his former boss was President Barack Obama. Yes, indeed. Uh, when, and uh, the, pre the former president and I served together in Illinois. We played basketball in the morning and cards in the evening together. Um, I didn't vote for him, just let you know that. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, so we have that in common, that, that, that we have a friendship with, with his former boss. But let me tell you that the secretary has been very fair with me, uh, and, and it's a great relationship in the fact that he doesn't blindside me with anything. I don't blindside him with anything. We see common ground where we can work together. And those areas where we disagree, uh, he and I talk in advance uh, so that uh, I can prepare to, to have my rebuttal if they all of a sudden start to do something. And then, and so far, it's been fairly small uh, things. Uh, 
uh, well, no, they're pretty big things. Uh, I, I know and I still believe that there was a law in 1992 that the VA cannot perform abortions. Um, and I will continue to fight them on that issue because they are now performing abortions. But they, I am also asking for information on what abortions are performed, how many, not names, because that would be illegal and we're not going to go down that path. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we need to know uh, what, how many times, as far as I'm concerned, they're violating the law. And that's money being spent that could be spent otherwise. And, yeah, and that's very important. The heads up in Washington is always very important. And uh, good to see that, obviously, you fight on some issues. Uh, you have been critical of President Biden's uh, budget, uh, specifically in this space. A little gimmicky. Uh, what do you think needs to, yeah, Congress needs and, to and change it? Let me it? explain that. Yeah. So when we passed the PACT Act, okay, it gave the ability to the secretary um, to move money over into uh, the toxic exposure fund and the toxic exposure fund actually becomes a, a, a uh, it is a mandatory spending so you're moving things from uh, a mandatory or from from discretionary fund over to mandatory and things that would have been paid for anyway and i it's kind of like it gives an opportunity for a shell game to hide certain things and or and and not saying that this secretary is doing because we're watching the line item pretty close but i don't know who's going to be there six months down the road two years down the road or the bureaucrats that are underneath the secretary that have that send that budget to us what are they what are they trying to hide when our job is oversight so i'm going to be very very cautious on that our staff is working uh, diligently to make sure we watch every line item. And But let me tell you that uh, in today's hearing, uh, the ranking member Takano agreed that, that he didn't think that was the intent. Now the secretary said, well, the law gave him the power to do that. Well, I understand, but if the law gives you the power to do something, it doesn't mean you automatically start doing it. It means you do it if it's necessary, but you need to explain why it's necessary. Mm-hmm. What's your message when you hear from uh, and, 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 and veterans watching this, uh, if they're disabled and they're, they want to get their health care, uh, what do you tell them to do? They're going through their own struggles. They don't know how to navigate the Washington system. What's your, your, your 30,000 feet a- a- advice for them? Get, your help, get, get some help from your local VSOs to have walked through this. They are out there. They're great. They're available to you. Understand that their service is free to you. Please seek that. Um, you know, I know it's difficult because I had to apply for a disability years ago, did not get it, still don't have it, but um, I knew what that paperwork was like to do deal with that on the appeals process. Um, we, have, we have streamlined that appeals process, but quite often, Regardless of what the services you're going to be receiving from the VA, you may need help navigating that. Reach out to your BFW or your Legion or any other VSOs that are out there. And believe me, there's lots of them. Um, seek help. Uh, if you're if you're now in the process of separating, listen and study your with their and get all the information you can from TAP um, and understand those services are available to you. Make sure you know each one of those and what they are. Last question. Many companies have given back and, and they participate in public-private partnerships for veterans. How, how, what, what's their role and how important is that in, in getting veterans the help they need? It's, it's very important. Uh, lots of the, the private companies, well, understand there's, there's actual companies. We're trying to deal with that to make sure that the veterans aren't, if you're talking about the services and them training them services, well, we're trying to make sure that the, the, that it is for the benefit of the veteran and not necessarily for the benefit of the company. Now, if you're talking about those companies that actually um, encourage hiring vets and providing education to vets and making sure that uh, veterans are moved from that military mindset over to the workforce, uh, whether it's in everything from air pilots to trucking to uh, management positions. There are so many companies out there that are aggressively pursuing um, to, to have veterans as their employees. Uh, they're great and we wanna work with them as much as we can. 
Mr. Chairman, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for me on.